All right. Oh, there we go. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jennifer Rose. Um, I'm an attorney at Julian Gray Associates, and I've also been on uh, the board of the foundation for about the last seven years or so. Um, and I have had a great time um, helping with the foundation, and I've met a lot of really terrific people along the way. So um, I may have even met some folks that are on here before. Um, so hopefully I'll see you at an event sometime. But today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I do in my day job and um, long-term care planning, which um, is a concern for all of us as we get older, but certainly um, for those um, of us in the Parkinson's community. So I'd like to talk about long-term care planning and how you can best be prepared at each stage of the aging process. Um, I'm also going to discuss a little bit about what I do as an elder law attorney um, and why elder law is different than traditional estate planning. So probably most of you have some degree um, of estate planning documents in place, but elder law is more than just those documents and it's more um, than just the considerations that you would have for when you pass away. So as elder law attorneys or as an elder law attorney, I'm always concerned with planning comprehensively. So like I said, that's more than just having those estate planning documents in place. I like to concentrate on not just what happens when you pass away, but I'm equally concerned about long-term care planning, um, i.e. what happens if you live a very long life and you have long-term care expenses, or if you have an unexpected diagnosis that requires long-term care, um, how you can best plan for that. So what I do is a combination of estate planning, um, but we do focus a little bit more probably on trust planning than uh, probate planning. So trust more than wills in some instances. Um, we look at tax planning um, and how you can help to best stretch your assets during your lifetime by making wise tax decisions. Um, we also plan a lot to expedite public benefits. We're fortunate in Pennsylvania that we do have a variety of different long-term care um, programs that can help to provide care both in a facility but also at home um, and also in sort of hybrid facilities where it's more of a day program um, with the rest of your life spent in your home. So I'll talk a lot today about those programs because I think everybody's always curious to know that um, care doesn't just have to be received in a facility. There's lots of opportunities to be able to have care provided at home. Um, I also focus a lot on special needs planning. Um, and where special needs planning is unique from elder care planning um, is this is for folks who are under the age of 60. So I have lots of clients who may have a disability or may have a family member with a disability. And I assist those clients with planning to protect you know, a family member that may have a special need, a grandchild or a child, or someone who may have a disability that begins um, before the traditional retirement age. Um, so primary goals for my clients and for me when I'm talking about long-term care planning, um, my primary goal is to make sure that clients have enough resources, whether that you know be insurance or public benefits or money that they've saved um, to pay for their care needs. Um, and, and typically that will involve trying to age in place as much as possible, um, or to be able to receive care in a facility of your choosing. Um, there's a lot of misconception that public benefits in Pennsylvania have to be used in a special state-run facility, but that's actually not the case. There's only a handful of skilled nursing facilities that don't accept Medicaid as a form of payment, um, only two that come to mind in Allegheny County. Um, the rest of the facilities, um, you know, across the spectrum, this, you know, in every part of the city and state do accept Medicaid um, and a great majority of the folks who are receiving care at that level um, are using Medicaid to pay for um, their care. Another primary concern of what I do is making sure that your spouse is protected. Um, if one member of a couple has high long-term care costs, often their, their concern is that they leave enough resources to make sure that their spouse um, can be comfortable in their retirement 
if there's ample resources left over, if their spouse would also need care. Um, so we're definitely looking to um, protect, protect spouses um, in the event that one member of the couple needs care. Uh, we also, you know, take a look to try to protect other family members. And frequently that may be a family member who has a special need. I have a lot of clients who have children um, who have resided with their parents their whole life and relied upon their parent. And the parent feels very strongly that they want to protect their home and protect resources. So um, when they're gone, their child is well taken care of um, or other family members, of course. Um, and as a secondary concern with long-term care planning attorneys like elder law attorneys, um, clients are always concerned with passing on resources to the next generation. So that's really where the connection between estate planning um, and making sure that things are easy and um, as straightforward as possible when you die to pass on resources to the next, next generation, but also to protect those resources so that you could use them and have the care that you need um, and be able to achieve both of those goals. So today in talking about long-term care planning, um, I'd, I'd like to talk about it as a continuum, um, starting with full independence and moving into possibly partial independence and then on to full care. And certainly each phase has its own considerations, um, but we don't always start at the beginning. Uh, certainly life can be a little bit easier if you plan in advance, but so many of my clients may come to me, you know, when they're independent um, and they're just newly retired and they're, you know, investigating what can I do to get ahead of these things. I, you know, um, I'm concerned, um, or maybe they just haven't updated their estate plan since their children were very young. Um, if you haven't updated things for 25 years, you're not alone because I, I frequently meet with folks who have been meaning to get around to it, but they just haven't. Um, often I'll meet with people at sort of that second phase where um, maybe there is a little bit of a need for care. Um, they maybe need some assistance at home or they're starting to look um, at downsizing or moving out of their house and into a, a personal care facility. Um, and they're maybe looking for some help to figure out, you know, we like this facility better than this one, but this one might be more expensive. And is there anything available to help us to cover these costs? And, you know, how, how should I best spend my assets? Is there, a, is there one account that's better to be used first? Um, and, you know, probably 50% of the time clients come to me and they haven't planned in advance. And I call that, you know, emergency planning. Um, and that's when there has been maybe a sudden medical event, or they just didn't know that this was something that they should think about doing. And there's already a need for skilled nursing facility care, and maybe the person is in rehab. But there's still a lot that can be done at every phase. So I, you know, would encourage you to never feel like things are too late if you are planning later than you'd like, or if you're learning about this type of planning um, later. Um, there is usually always something that we can do to make things better. So, um, but at phase one, so at that more independent um, phase, typically, you know, these are retirees who are looking ahead. Um, maybe there isn't any sort of concern for long-term care yet. Um, and at this phase, you certainly do have broader options and more control over um, the decisions that you make. And, and the documents that you put in place. Um, sometimes this phase, we have families who have an indication of long-term care needs. So this could be a family history. Um, this could be an early diagnosis um, of dementia or Parkinson's. Um, it could also be awareness of a family member with a special need. Um, Perhaps, you know, going back to the example of a client who has a child with a special need and a disability, and they're really worried um, that, you know, life won't be easy and that assets won't be passed on in the proper way. Um, and they don't want to interrupt the public benefits that their family member may use. And so that's all phase one. Um, and we're able to go through a lot of different options um, at that point. And some of the things that you, um, would certainly want to talk about at that initial phase or really at any phase that you would want to have in place. Um, all the basics that you've probably heard of, so a last will and testament, um, powers of attorney, 
health care powers of attorney, uh, living wills. We'll often talk about a variety of different types of trusts. It really depends on um, where clients are, whether we talk about a revocable trust versus an irrevocable trust. We might even talk a little bit about long-term care insurance. Sometimes clients will come to me and they say, hey, my financial advisor has suggested that maybe um, you know, I invest in long-term care insurance. Um, I certainly don't think what I do and, and long-term care insurance are, are mutually exclusive. Long-term care insurance can be terrific and it can give you a lot of options, but it is super expensive. And if you already have a diagnosis, sometimes it's impossible um, to get, but certainly both what I do and long-term care insurance are never a bad idea. Um, sometimes I'll have clients who come to me at this point, they're thinking about possibly moving into a continuing care retirement community, and they're trying to figure out how to best leverage their assets to be able to afford to do that. Um, and, and, you know, the buy-ins for those facilities can be very expensive. And we're trying to look ahead to see, is there anything we can do to help with that? Is there anything, you know, if you move up through the levels of care, those facilities do still do charge for each level. So you can um, combine long-term care benefits with you know, some of the benefits that you get from the buy-in at a continuing care retirement community. And then I have other clients who come to me who are still working, um, but they have a disability and maybe they're working part-time and they're having a hard time finding insurance. And there is a really great program in Pennsylvania that um, a lot of people don't know about that's called MAUD. It's Medical Assistance for Workers with Disabilities. Um, and it's an entrance into the Medicaid program for private health care insurance that um, has a much higher income threshold. And so I have a lot of younger clients who are working, but they're disabled and you know they may need um, some assistance or home care, but they still wanna keep their jobs. And so we're able to work with them to help um, to achieve all those goals as well. Um, but regardless of your age or level of health, the one document that I do think is the most critical that everyone who's over the age of 18 should have um, is a well-drafted general durable power of attorney. Um, a power of attorney is it's relatively straightforward to create. Um, a principal, so the person who creates it, appoints an agent to handle their financial matters. Um, if the principal needs assistance in the future, the agent can conduct business on their behalf. Um, so in order to create a power of attorney, the person, the principal has to understand uh, what they're signing and the authority that they're giving to their agent. If that person becomes incapacitated in the future and they don't have a power of attorney in place, they can't create a power of attorney at that time. Um, the alternate solution is filing a petition to have the person declared incapacitated with the guardianship court um, and then court oversight with the orphans court from that point forward, which is, is a very lengthy and expensive process that can be avoided by having that document in place. So for me, phase one of long-term care planning is always making sure that even if you decide not to carry out any advanced planning, that you do have someone appointed it as your agent. So if it becomes necessary in the future, that person can step in and help you. Um, and to that end, you want a really good, comprehensive, general durable power of attorney that gives your agent the authority to maybe create a trust, maybe, you know, to transfer assets around, to, to file for public benefits. So all powers of attorney aren't created equal, um, but that really is the document that I use the most often to help people who maybe didn't plan at phase one and who are coming to me at a, at a later phase in long-term care planning. Um, but I can do a lot more, you know, if I have an agent that can assist me, if the person, uh, the client, so to speak, does not have capacity um, any longer. Another component to early planning um, is trust planning. And so there's all sorts of different types of trusts that can be created as part of a long-term care plan. Um, you may have heard of living trusts um, or a revocable living trust. Um, you may have heard of a special needs trust. Um, in, in my world, um, we, I use a lot of irrevocable trusts which aren't as scary as they seem because in Pennsylvania, you actually can change an irrevocable trust. So even though that's in the title, it's not um, as scary of a word because you can make amendments to any type of trust under Pennsylvania law, as long as all the involved parties are willing to make that change. Uh, 
But with an, an asset protection trust, which is what we typically call an irrevocable trust um, that helps to shelter assets from a variety of life events. So most often in my practice, an asset protection trust is used to protect life savings um, and real estate from a spin down to cover nursing home costs. Um, so if a trust is properly drafted, um, it can preserve all the favorable tax treatments that someone may have um, if they decide to sell their house and downsize in the future. Um, it can also give the creator of the trust the right to use the income that their assets produce, the right to live in their home, um, the right to change homes if they decide to buy a new home or to sell their home. Um, so with an asset protection trust, we're trying to work within the framework of the Medicaid rules, which do have a five-year look-back period attached to them. So in early planning, um, and this is maybe oversimplifying, but you can really take your life savings, your home, and move it into an irrevocable asset protection trust. And if you need no care um, in the next five years, if ever you need Medicaid care, all of the assets that are in the trust aren't considered your assets for purposes of the Medicaid application. So it can be a really nice way to plan in advance to take those assets that you want to keep safe and to shift them over here. Um, the person who creates the trust can also be the trustee. So um, there's a misconception that often trust planning will involve getting a bank involved or letting your children be trustees. That's not the case. Um, most of my clients um, remain as their own trustees. So they're in control of how the trust works. They're in control of how the money's invested. They're in control of when distributions are made. So it's just more of a titling change, not a tax change. And it's certainly not giving away all of your control. Um, so in early phases, a five-year look back period is very achievable. And um, that is always something that I like to talk to clients about um, if they have enough resources um, that that makes sense for them. Um, and to that end, you know, in my world with long-term care planning, we're not talking about millionaires, you know, we're not talking about with people with loads and, and millions and millions of dollars. Most of my clients have somewhere between, you know, $50,000 and, and $800,000 um, because though that would be um, a nice retirement and a nice, you know, long-term care costs can be very expensive at $120,000 a year for skilled nursing facility care. So the average person, um, which is my client, um, is far more concerned with preserving what they have because they don't have endless resources to spend. Um, so phase two um, of a sort of the continuum of long-term care, at least in my mind, um, is when um, clients reach a point of partial independence. So perhaps there's a need for some assistance and maybe that care is being provided by family members, perhaps a spouse um, is critical in assisting with care. Um, but at that point, we're starting to look at, is there anything that we can do to take some of that caregiving uh, role off of the caregiver? Um, if we're starting to consider bringing some caregivers into the home, are we starting to to consider some day programs, perhaps personal care. Um, there's lots of programs to choose from in Pennsylvania. So if you'll bear with me, I always like to make sure that people are aware of the options that exist because the planning that I do is only helpful um, if there um, is, is an end game to that. So um, with trust planning, these are the types of programs that we would be trying to expedite eligibility for folks so that if they get to the point um, where they're at phase two. If they've done a trust, hopefully everything in that trust is exempt and they can use those benefits um, far more quickly. Um, if they haven't done advanced planning, you know, we can still try to expedite eligibility for these programs. Um, so it doesn't mean that, you know, every, not every client has a trust. That's, you know, not going to be the case for everyone. But these are just some of the, the programs um, listed on my um, slideshow here that I'm going to talk about. So first is home and community-based services um, or community health choices. In Pennsylvania, this program has been given uh, a ton of different names over the years. And so you may have heard it called um, 
the aging waiver, you may have heard it called the independence waiver or the attendant care waiver. Um, but basically what this is, is this is a Medicaid home care program. Um, it's for anybody over the age of 18 that needs a skilled level of care, uh, but they want to receive that care in the community. And I will say that the, the level of care needed for this is a little bit more flexible and lower than um, skilled care in a facility. Um, but it's a great program. It can provide um, some, for some clients, they have 24 hour a day care. Um, the care is typically provided by a home health agency of some sort, or other families will have one of their children be a paid caregiver. Um, some clients will hire their own private duty person and the state will pay that person to provide care. So it's a really neat program. Um, the tricky thing at the moment is just making, you know, finding the appropriate staffing for it. Um, but when it works, it works very well. To qualify for this program, your physician would need to indicate that you have a need for um, a nursing facility level of care. But like I said, for home care programs, it's a little bit lighter. Usually it's needing assistance with at least two activities of daily living or having dementia um, that rises to a certain level. Um, there is an income test for this program, but they're only looking at the income of the person who needs care. So if you're a married couple um, and one member of the couple you know, needs the care, they're only going to look at the gross income of that person. And there are some exceptions. So in recent history, um, I've been able to assist clients that are over this 2382 income limit um, with obtaining these benefits as long as they're less than $500 over. So um, 2882 is, 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 a, is a better number to look at. Um, in those cases, the extra income has to go into a trust every month and be used for medical care, but that works very nicely. So um, don't let the income cap necessarily um, concern you that you wouldn't be eligible for this program if you need it. Um, if you're under the age of 60, um, there are some exceptions. And so I have clients now who are um, thousands of dollars over the income test. I have a client who has ALS and um, he's under the age of 60 and he gets 24 hour a day care and he is well over this income test um, cap. So, you know, this is a terrific program, um, especially, you know, if you have someone who lives with you who can um, monitor the caregiving. Um, some of the things that this program provides are in-home care um, there's some adaptive equipment and home modification options. I've had clients um, get a chairlift on their stairs. Um, I've had clients um, have assistance helping a, a bathroom to become handicap accessible, to get hospital beds. Medicaid benefits come with this, so co-pays for um, prescription costs and hospital stays and doctor visits all get picked up by the program. Um, there's a meal delivery component if you want it. There's safety monitoring, so they'll pay for the life alert. They'll pay for the, the safety monitoring. And like I mentioned before, family members can be paid as a caregiver, except the spouse and someone who's also serving as the financial power of attorney. So if there's ever a case where a child you know, has quit their job to help care for mom or dad, this program can be really nice to help that child um, be compensated for the work that they're doing. Um, there's a lot of steps for application for this program. Um, your doctor would have to indicate that you need the services. There's um, two different evaluations, one by the um, Pennsylvania Independent Enrollment Broker, um, by the Area Agency on Aging. You have to file a Medicaid application. And then once you're approved, there's a care plan. And under the new rules, you would choose an insurance agency. So there's four different managed care organizations in Pennsylvania that would help to create this care plan um, for a recipient. So um, locally, a lot of people go with UPMC, um, but there's others that do a nice job. And you have basically this care management um, you know, group with the insurance company that help to staff and get the hours um, covered for the care that you need at home. Um, I'm a big fan of this program. Um, and I, you know, I'm always happy when I'm able to use this as an alternative to nursing home care placement for someone. Act 150 is another program that's sort of similar to the waiver program. Um, there's no income or asset 
test for this program. So you don't have to jump through the Medicaid hoops, but you do have to get denied for Medicaid first. Um, it's not quite as robust in the services that it provides. Um, there is a small copay um, and you do have to be under the age of 60 to apply for this program. But before we had um, some of the exceptions that have now been made for the income cap. I had a lot of clients who were over that income cap, but they really needed, you know, attendant care services, and we would use Act 150. Um, I think the changes in the income are going to probably make some changes to Act 150. There used to be a waiting list, but I suspect that waiting list will get a little shorter since more people can use um, the uh, Community Health Choices Program that I was just talking about. Life Pittsburgh is another really neat program that I love. Um, I don't know if anybody has heard of that, but what it stands for is Living Independence for the Elderly. Um, it has the same rules for Medicaid um, that we'll talk about a little bit later, um, and the same rules for um, your medical needs for as for the community health choices. Um, but what it is, is it's an adult day service program that provides care at a facility. So if you're in the city, there's um, two locations on the north side. There's one in Green Tree. Um, they're in Washington County. They have a really nice center that's near where the Washington Wild Things ballpark is. Um, but under the program, um, someone from the program comes and picks people up in the mornings. If you are wheelchair bound or if you have mobility issues, they have special transportation that they can get you to the center in. And at the center, you will have your care. Um, your PCP becomes the facility position. Um, your care needs are met there. You may have a bath, you may have lunch, you may um, be driven to a specialist appointment. Um, this is a great program for um, you know, families who have a caregiver, you know, children who work, who have a difficult time getting time off to go to, you know, assist with doctor's appointments. Um, this is a 55 plus program. Um, so, you know, you can start using it at a younger age um, and you would attend the center that's in your zip code. But most zip codes in Allegheny County and the surrounding counties um, do have life centers um, and you can look them up. But it's a really great program because um, staffing can be a little bit easier with this program. If someone calls off, they have other people to fill in. Um, and they do provide, you know, I, I always say it's like adult daycare on steroids because they, um, they do bathing, they do, you know, self-care. Your podiatrist may come to the center. Your um, eye doctor may come to the center. And so everything happens is in this centralized um, facility. They also provide a little bit of care coordination at home. They will help uh, their recipients, you know, get into the house in the evenings, maybe get ready for bed. There's a, you know, a meal plan component and some, um, you know, wraparound services that happen. It doesn't typically provide care on the weekend. So um, if someone needs full care, they'll need some family support. Uh, but it is a really terrific program that is, is worth investigating. Another benefit that I um, help clients with often are VA benefits. So there's two types of VA benefits. There's compensation and there's pension with aid and attendance. Um, sometimes clients can use both the VA benefit and the Medicaid benefit at the same time. I have several clients where one member of the couple use the VA, uses the VA benefit and the other member of the couple uses Medicaid and we're able to stack benefits on top of each other, um, which can really, especially in a home care situation, can really provide a lot of services in someone's home. Um, but other clients use the VA benefit to um, hire a private duty caregiver, to help absorb some of the costs of personal care. Um, so it's a really um, neat program. So from the perspective of VA compensation benefits, um, these are service-connected disabilities. So in order to be approved um, for compensation, a veteran has to have a war time, or I'm sorry, has to have a service-connected disability. Um, but the VA has recognized certain cancers and other health um, problems as presumptive diseases associated with exposure to Agent Orange or other um, herbicides during military service. And Parkinson's disease is on that list. Um, if anyone you know 
um, with a Parkinson's diagnosis was in country in Vietnam. And that could be, you know, um, a ship that came down a waterway so far. Um, they're always adding locations. Some locations were domestic. Um, Camp Lejeune had an issue with its water supply. So if you know a veteran with Parkinson's and you suspect that they might have been exposed to Agent Orange, you should really look at their service records to see because the compensation benefits are relatively substantial. Um, most clients who have compensation, you know, the benefits are, you know, you know, $3,500 a month um, or greater. And if your cause of death is would be Parkinson's or one of the presumptive um, diseases, then those benefits continue for your spouse. Or if you're on the benefits for at least 10 years, they continue for your spouse. So um, that is you know, definitely a benefit um, that you would wanna work, look into. Um, now VA pension is probably the benefit that I deal with most often. Um, it can help to supplement care costs uh, for wartime veterans. So for this benefit, you have to have been um, an active duty um, veteran during a period of war, but you only have to have served for one day during a declared period of war to qualify. Um, it is a benefit for veterans and their surviving spouses. Um, and the way it works is if your medical costs exceed your income, the VA will give you a monthly stipend to help you know, meet your other needs. So there's a misconception that you apply for the VA benefit and the VA sends you the money to go and, and you know, hire a caregiver or to move to a personal care facility. It's actually the opposite. You have to prove to them that you're paying out of pocket and that it's exceeding your monthly income need and then they will reimburse you. So it can be a little tricky because sometimes you've got to start um, the care costs um, before you can get the funds, which, you know, puts people at a deficit for a little bit. But the VA, once approved, it does go back in time to the date that you applied. So they would reimburse you back to the date of eligibility. Um, these benefits have changed a little bit. Now there's a three-year look-back period for, for VA benefits. So to, to, to go back to the trust planning a bit, um, the trust can be uh, critical with the VA benefit, um, just like with the Medicaid, because you they will have a three-year look back. Um, under the old VA rules, you could transfer resources into a trust and technically um, apply the next day and not have to disclose those resources, but those rules have been changed. Um, so bear that in mind if you are a veteran or married to a veteran. So just to give you the numbers, these are the maximum benefit amounts for that pension benefit. For a married veteran, um, you know, the benefits can be as high as $22.95 a month. Um, for a surviving spouse of a veteran, um, it's about not, it's a little greater than half that, so $12.44, but it can certainly make a difference um, insofar as paying for long-term care costs or personal care um, costs. So the final phase of long-term care planning in my work um, is when clients come to me with, um, a need for skilled facility care. Um, typically, this is the highest level of care. And certainly, if you've pre-planned and you have a trust, then we're just starting to carry out a plan that was started years ago. Um, or if you met with me and I said, you know, trust doesn't make sense for you, then we may be carrying out a plan that we had talked about um, years before. Um, Sometimes it's emergency planning. You know, this is the first time that I'm meeting with someone and they've just received their, you know, first $11,000 a month bill from a nursing facility. Um, and they want to make sure that they're making the wisest decisions they possibly can um, in moving forward. And like I said before, it's never too late to plan. The Medicaid rules for married couples, especially um, in Pennsylvania, are kinder than you think. Um, for single folks who may need long-term care, there's still a lot that we can do. Um, I normally tell folks that if you, you know, get to me quickly at admission, I can usually, you know, depending on what you've done, worst case scenario is we can typically protect about half um, of what you have, worst case scenario. Um, you know, frequently a lot better than that, but um, that's, a, that's a lot of the work that I see. Um, but at this crisis planning level, 
Um, there is typically an immediate need for medical um, care. And the focus at this point is on the care, is on you know helping to get those costs covered. But timing is critical. So if there is an admission to a facility, um, you know before you pay too many months at the facility, it is important to sit down with someone because um, if you um, owe a bill at the facility, you typically owe the bill. There's not much that we can do to go back in time to fix that. Um, but Medicaid in Pennsylvania, and, and, and this is a lot of info, but um, you may have heard it called medical assistance. That's the, the, the name in Pennsylvania is medical assistance. And it is a means tested entitlement program. Um, but most people who need long term care do eventually qualify, even if they don't do anything, um, because that care is so expensive. Um, statistically, two thirds of nursing home residents are receiving Medicaid benefits. So if you're visiting someone at a skilled nursing facility, you know, you would have no clue who's paying privately and who is using public benefits to pay. Um, you know, it, it, even the staff has no idea um, how bills are getting paid. Um, don't confuse Medicaid with Medicare. Often people believe that Medicare will pay the nursing home bill, but Medicare just pays for the rehab portion of the nursing home stay. So up to 100 days, but unfortunately these days we don't see most people get more than a few weeks of rehab before Medicare um, stops payment and private insurance stops payment. And at that point, if the level of care that's needed is a skilled facility, it becomes private pay. And the average cost of a skilled nursing facility in Pennsylvania right now is about $365 a day. So, you know, probably a little bit more than an average stay at the, the William Penn Hotel downtown, unfortunately, very pricey. Um, but just generally speaking, um, the eligibility requirements for medical assistance um, for the person who needs the care um, is anywhere from $2,400 to $8,000. Um, but if you're a married couple, um, there's a lot of resources that are protected, and even if you're a single person, there's a lot of resources that are protected. Your home is exempt, um, but there is what's called a state recovery in Pennsylvania. So you people get a false sense of security that the house is protected, so you really would need to talk with an attorney about making sure that upon the Medicaid recipient's death, it doesn't go through a state recovery and get collected to reimburse um, Pennsylvania for the cost that they pay. Um, but just generally speaking, to, to be eligible, your car's um, exempt, your house is exempt, household goods, um, some life insurance, um, prepayment for funerals and for burial accounts. Um, and then on um, top of that, um, if your spouse has a retirement account, and that could be a bit, I just actually met with a client the other day, and I was, I was so disgruntled when I met with her. She had a $250,000 IRA and her husband needed nursing facility care. And when she talked with the business office and the social worker and even the local Department of Human Services, they said, you're gonna have to spend down your qualified retirement account, which just wasn't true. As the community spouse who didn't need care, her IRA was 100% exempt. And unfortunately, she was being told that she needed to spend it. When I looked at their resources, I realized her husband was eligible for Medicaid without doing anything at all. But she was getting bad advice and was being told that she needed to cash in and spend $250,000 that was technically hers to keep as her retirement account. So there's a lot of bad information that floats out around there, uh, you know, that even facilities and sad to say, some county assistance offices who oversee these programs, that people are um, told to spend money that they don't legally have to use. Um, so you want to be careful and get advice to make sure that, you know, you're not led astray. Um, in her case, you know, we'll be fixing that and we'll be making, you know, she fortunately hadn't liquidated anything or carried out any of this bad advice. Um, but bear in mind that the qualified accounts of the person who doesn't need care are completely exempt. There could be a million dollars in there and they would be exempt. Um, assets in a special needs trust are exempt. Um, if you have a rental property, um, those are exempt. So there's lots of things that just off the top um, that a good elder law attorney should be able to, you know, look at what you have and say, you know, here's what you is protected, here are the things that we need to worry about and, and to get to where we need to be. 
Um, there's also income components. People worry, well, what will I live on as a community spouse if my loved one needs care? There's a bare minimum um, of monthly income that that spouse can keep. If they don't have that amount of income themselves, they can take a portion of their spouse's income. So these are just numbers in a vacuum. Um, you know, these are going to be different for every every person. Um, but there is a monthly income stipend, you know, that you won't be, um, you know, under. Um, if you have income that exceeds that, that is the community spouse's own income, then, you know, there's nothing. Or if that spouse is still working, their income can't be part of the cost sharing component of Medicaid. Um, so with a married couple, um, the healthy spouse or the community spouse can keep up to half of the assets that the couple owns. And this is assets aside from those exempt assets. So that's of the assets that are countable. So let's say you have you know, bank accounts and joint investment accounts. Um, the healthy spouse can keep half up to a cap of 130,000. Um, so as you can see, the Medicaid rules, you know, are, are different than um, Medicaid for healthcare insurance or Medicaid um, for um, children and families. Um, but these, these numbers are different for everyone. If someone has $100,000, the community spouse can keep 50. If you have $300,000, you're capped at this 130. So it's important to have someone uh, run these numbers for you specifically because every, you know, every person on this Zoom is gonna have a different financial picture if ever they need to apply for medical assistance. If there would ever be a need for Medicaid, and um, of course, like I mentioned before, things that have been placed into a trust years before won't be part of this analysis because they'll be exempt. Uh, but in an emergency situation or in a situation where not everything is placed in the trust, um, often you'll hear the term spend down. Uh, and what the, I like to refer to it more as reallocation. So if you have assets that are over the limit for the program that you're trying to obtain eligibility for. There's things you can buy and things you can do. Um, you can um, pay off debts, you can prepay your funeral expenses, you can buy a new car, you can pay off your mortgage, you can make repairs to your home, um, you can um, purchase an annuity that would give the healthy spouse more income than that figure that was in the last slide. And I encourage clients to try and carry out these sorts of recommendations rather than just, you know, writing um, terribly large checks to a facility every month until they reach the asset threshold for eligibility. Uh, you know, you can really shift things around um, and reallocate what you have in a smart way uh, so that the, the spouse in the community um, you know, has more resources to retire on. And as a single person, there's often things that we can do as well. So um, this planning isn't just for married couples. Um, there's certainly, it's a little bit more complicated, but um, not a problem. I touched on this a bit, um, but there is a look back period for transfers of resources. So um, if you apply for Medicaid, you have to provide five years worth of statements for all your financial accounts to the Department of Human Services. And what they are looking for is, you know, did you give away money to your children or charity or um, a trust or anything that would um, have implications for Medicaid down the road? Um, if all of those transactions have occurred, if they're under a certain amount, it's fine. Um, if they were longer than five years ago, it's fine. If they went to an exempt party, um, they're fine. And so there's always going to be special um, exemptions for everyone that it's important to have someone look at your specific case. Um, but that is what they're looking at. And if you have um, transferred resources in a way that they're not okay with, then it can delay when you would become eligible for Medicaid. So basically for every $365 that's been gifted um, in the last five years could cause a delay for Medicaid for one day. So if you're going to do stuff like that, and I, you know, I encourage people to have good planning, and you know, frequently that involves gifts and trusts, and and um, you just want to do it in a controlled fashion. That's why I like trusts because if you would need care before that five-year clock stops ticking and you have a trust, we know all the money's in the trust, 
And so if Medicaid doesn't start immediately for you, it's going to start a lot faster than it would have if you hadn't done um, the, the planning, but we want it in a controlled way because we don't um, you know, want you to be ineligible for Medicaid for a period of time without the resources to cover the care that you need. Um, so, you know, a good plan does, you know, often take advantage of um, playing by the rules um, by having a good plan in place. And so I wanted to leave some time for questions today. Um, I don't know if anybody has anything that they would, would like to ask, but um, I'm available. Thank you, Jennifer. If you do have a question, you can either type it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask the question. I can't see the chat, so if any. If okay. Oh, yes, I can. So I'm going to I'm going to stop uh, screen. Sharing. Okay, great. Okay, there we go. So now I can see. Um, and I see that David had uh, posted that um, Life Care is a national program that's rolled out through the county, and he's right. Um, yeah, nearly all the counties have it. Um, it's, I like it. So yeah, <laughs> but if you need to look yours up, I do think that there is a um, there is a website I believe that you can put your um, zip code in, and it would help connect you to uh, your local program. Okay, great. Your presentation was very thorough. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I, oh, I do see a question on the chat. It says, does a trust, will, power of attorney remain in effect if you should move out of state? That's a good question. So if you have a trust um, or estate planning documents and you don't, I, I do typically recommend that if you're going to change states that you consider updating the documents because each state has unique rules. But if you don't update them, they typically will still work for you. Um, if someone moves here and they have an out-of-state power of attorney and they don't have capacity to do a new one, I'm still grateful that they have that document in place because we can still use it. Um, but if you get the opportunity to have things looked at, trusts don't always have to be updated, um, but for the other items, um, it's never a bad idea to have a local, you know, in the new state, a new attorney take a look. Um, but in a pinch, they would, they would be fine. Thank you to the person who said it was through. <laughs> and if anybody does want to talk about their specific situation, um, you know, it, it is tricky to talk about this type of planning in a vacuum. Um, what I normally have people do is fill out a questionnaire. The questionnaire does ask a lot of background information about you. It would ask, you know, um, you know, it would go over your assets and your um, your marital situation and your children. You know, it, it is a lot of personal information. But what's nice about that is then I can look at your specific case um, and we can sit down and go over what this would look like and mean for you. Um, because no case, you know, there is no cookie cutter case. Everything is, you know, dependent on um, where where you are in the care continuum, uh, the type of assets that you have. Um, you know, your, your family situation. So those are available on our website if anybody would like me to take a look at their specific case, um, or you can email me. Um, my email, I think, is at the end of the presentation, but it's just jennifer at grayelderlaw.com. Um, you know, I know this is, it's very thorough and it's, it's a lot of info, but. All yeah, right. I think. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer, and for everyone attending. Thanks for having me. You're welcome.